How's it going, everybody? Uh, my name is McKeever, Edward Conwell II. I go by Mac. I am a portfolio manager for TEDCO, the Maryland Technology Development Corporation. We are essentially the investment arm of the state of Maryland. We take $21 million from the state every year, and we put a majority of that to work in the early stage tech companies through nine different funding programs. Good evening. My name is Jeffrey Mund. I'm the founder and managing general partner of MCVC Partners. We invest in startups three ways. First is as limited partners in other venture funds. Second is syndicate leads. And third is as direct angel investors. I'm also the co-founder of an accelerator in Annapolis called FounderTrack. FounderTrack is free and founder friendly. Our last cohort had six out of 10 of the complete pitch on stage group, minority or female founders. And they raised $6.5 million as a cohort. So I'm a co-creator of that accelerator. And that is all pro bono to bring great access to content, mentorship, and capital into a town I care about because I was a graduate of the Naval Academy in Annapolis. So I'm a proud son of Baltimore, Maryland. I got my nomination to the Academy from Senator Sarbanes Sr. Excited to be here to give back a little bit. Nice. That's cool. <laughs> I, I want to know this guy. Okay, my name, my name is Calvin. I'm, uh, I'm from Camden Partners, which is a growth equity firm based here in Baltimore. We invest in companies that are five to twenty million in revenue, EBITDA positive, that are in healthcare, education, tech-enabled business services, and fintech. Uh, we recently did a first close on our sixth fund, and um, that was an eighty million dollar close on a two hundred million dollar total fund um, raise that we're going to be doing. Uh, and since then, we've done about three investments: one here in Baltimore, a company that some of you may know called Catalyte, and um, we're we're currently on the term sheet on our fourth. For each fund, we'll typically do about 12 to 15 investments. Um, the company was founded in 1995. I started in May of 2018. Also a Baltimore, um, Baltimore boy. So nice to see you guys. Former candidate for mayor. Former candidate for mayor. I mean, you know, there's a resume. <laughs> <laughs> Can't sit too close to this guy. Um, Kyle O'Connor. I'm uh, one of the co-founders and partners at the Startup Nest. We are a co-working space and an incubator space in southwest Baltimore. Um, we are Baltimore's largest minority-owned co-working space in the city. Uh, we self-funded this project ourselves, so me and my two partners, we are all serial entrepreneurs. Um, just last year, we did our first, um, we don't call it an accelerator, but we call it pitch days. Um, we're not nearly at that level yet. Um, but we had the opportunity to get uh, six companies funded, uh, close to $3.2 million, and we're very proud of that. Um, right now we're expanding to our second floor, and we have a 25,000 square foot footprint that we're growing into. So happy to be here. Awesome. Thank you for those introductions. So we'll start with our first question. And uh, when you know talented folks out there have great ideas and they want to get something started, uh, in the minority community, one of the, one of the things we know that it's reported that 1.8% uh, or so of minority-led startups actually end up getting funding ultimately. So um, in your view, why is that the case and what can be done to improve those <coughs> odds? I'll go ahead and kick it off. Not that I have the, the best license to speak on that, but I think that um, when you're thinking specifically about seed stage funding, there is a macro trend that is troubling across any seed stage entrepreneur that's starting a company. The first is that the cost of starting a company is lower than it's ever been before. So the supply of startups is larger than it's ever been before. So you have more people competing across the same set of dollars. And when you think about the funds that are accessible, if you read what's in the paper, you might get fooled into thinking that hey, last year was a banner year for venture capital. But when you peel back the onion a little bit, that money is going to less companies, bigger check sizes, and later stage. Mm -hmm. And so from a founder's perspective, it's not about that last $200,000 that gets you from 800 to a million. It's the first $200,000 because that's when you can quit your day job and lean into your startup. So really, if the denominator of the supply is getting bigger, I would argue the numerator is getting smaller. Less people can raise their hand and say, I raised the first $200,000 for my startup. And that makes it more difficult than ever. And so that's why, as, as part of today, I'd love to be able to share some strategies on how to get past that. Because this is a really tough time 
in the ecosystem to raise startup capital. And so I, I agree with all of Jeff's points. What I would say specifically for black and brown founders, the first set of money a startup typically gets is friends and family capital, right? And so what we constantly hear, and this is one of the reasons why Calvin and I helped start what is now known the Builder Fund at TEDCO, is that black and brown founders don't have access to friends and family capital, right? They don't have access to the first 10,000, 25,000, 50,000 just to get started to the point where they can even compete for what little bit of early stage capital that's out there. And so, and, and the biggest thing is, and one of the points that Jeff bore was, it's so much cheaper now to start a business. Investors can wait longer for companies to de-risk themselves. They can wait longer to put money in because so many people are taking what little bit of money they have and getting really, really far. The problem is for those folks who don't have access to that little bit of cash to get started, they have no way to truly compete, which is night and day compared to like what we used to see in the early 90s because in the early 90s when you wanted to start a website, some people here may know, some may not. If you wanted to start a website in 95, you couldn't because you needed to buy your own servers to put them on the web. And so nobody had money to just go physically buy servers to go put a website up. So what they did was they would go pitch to an investor with their PowerPoint say, this is the website we're going to build. And the investor would give them millions of dollars to just buy servers so they could just put a website up. Sight unseen, not knowing if it will ever work. That was how venture was done in that day. But because it's gotten so, cheap, so much cheaper and so much easier to do it, they nobody wants to invest that early anymore. And I think that's one of the fundamental things that's happened. The, 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 the risk tolerance has changed because of the amount of companies there are out there, which puts those who don't have the ability to even get, to even get started so they can get into that rat race, puts you at a significant disadvantage. Yeah, I think I, I would like to add, and I think two great groups of points that these two gentlemen made, and to add to that, one of the challenges that I've noticed that a lot of founders, especially minority founders face, is when you finally get in front of an investor, what you present is not what is necessary to, to be successful at getting the funding you want. Uh, and what I mean is that you're doing your job, you're doing your business, you're very good at that, you've built something that has legs. But when you're presenting to someone who sees thousands of pitch decks in you know, a, few, a few years, or I should say hundreds in a year, they're, they're gonna evaluate you based on a few things. And if you don't hit those few things, they're automatically going to pass on you. Um, those things are, first, what's your problem statement? Second, what's your solution to that problem? What's the total addressable market? How do you make money? What's your revenue model? So these things, if you miss them, no one's going to give you money. And it's, it's very difficult a lot of times to find the resources as a young entrepreneur to know what those things are and to get the coaching you need up front. To be able, before it's time to be in front of the the, the money the money folks because you don't know what you don't know because you don't know what you don't know blind spots yeah all, all good points you know one of the things that I would say that I that we see on a consistent basis uh, at our space is uh, a lot of minority entrepreneurs don't know their numbers as well as they need to um, I think you know just yes, yesterday we had a, a conversation with one of our newest members and. You know, they are doing something very disruptive in the technology field for professional golf. And it was a very interesting niche um, that kind of sparked the conversation. But when you kind of peel the onion and look under the covers to see, you know, well, what is your burn rate? What is some of the, you know, where are your dollars going initially? You know, if the technology is not ready, you don't need to go out and hire 100 salespeople. You know what I mean? You need to focus on your numbers and make sure that, like Max said, you know, you need to be as lean as possible for as long as possible so that you can go out and get as much traction as possible. And I think that, you know, at least in our experience, what we've seen with minority entrepreneurs is, you know, we have to demystify the whole mindset of what it means to go out and actually get money. Because I don't know who was here previously, but Max said, you know, as soon as you get that check, you are on the clock. You're on the clock, and that is very real. And we've seen some very real situations where, you know, if people don't take it seriously, it can go, you know, in a very, you know, wrong direction. So understanding your numbers up front, understanding, you know, what your runway is, how far can you get on your own, how how lean can you be, how bootstrapped can you be, um, because that that makes a big difference in the long run. I'll say one more thing here, and I think that there's. A there's a fundamental misunderstanding when founders are pitching 
about who the talent is in the room in that conversation. The talent is not the capital. No. The talent is the entrepreneur. It's the person that has the idea. And when you really see the, the traction happen and the conversation shift, it's not about pitching people or selling them on your idea. It's on the venture side of the table how the folks that have capital can be lucky enough to be in the deal. About 95% of all the returns in venture come from about 5% of the deals. So for the really elite founders that are framing the conversation the right way, folks that are providing capital are feeling lucky to be in the conversation. My wife jokes with me and she says, well, what's wrong with you, Jeff? Most guys go for a job interview and they're trying to get paid. You're interviewing to try to give away money, mm. to try to be in that right deal. And so I think reframing that conversation around who the talent in the room is, is super important. And once you've done that, it's not about who you know, friends and family that is wealthy. It's actually about who do you know, friends and family that's smart. It's not about friends and family, it's about dinner party conversation money at that round. It's how do you take the people that are holding a PhD or holding access to information that are powerful in the space that you can empower on a Friday night to go out and instead of boring their friends about, hey, I'm opening a car wash and here's what I'm doing with this, I've got this great new business idea that I think is smart. And with a PhD behind that, there'll be somebody in that dinner conversation that does have capital. And so it's less about who you know that has capital and more about who you know that's intelligent and can be a thought leader in that space. And so I'd love to see more and more founders build that people power network, not around who's wealthy, but who can vouch for the idea and provide intellectual support behind it. I like that. Don't look for capital, look for advice. So, yeah. and one last point I'll make before we move to the next question is, I very often find minority entrepreneurs going out to pitch and raise capital way too early because they have a lot of early stage entrepreneurs don't necessarily understand how venture capital works but they see these articles on TechCrunch about so-and-so got money from having an idea on the back of a napkin. That's not really true. That's not really how this works, right? If there's ever somebody who gets money from doing a presentation off of the back of a napkin, there's a whole backstory to it. It ain't they just met this investor and they showed him a great idea. It's that they met this investor who went to school with their, with their father and were roommates and, you know, was doing this guy's sock. But you never hear those backstories. So whenever you hear a story of a founder just got money, there's a whole lot else to happen. And generally speaking, raising money is hard for everybody, period, right? And so you need to go in understanding what it means to raise venture money or raise money, period, before you just start going to do it. Because I've seen a lot of entrepreneurs go in and be like, I keep pitching to these folks, and they keep saying they're early stage investors, but nobody wants to invest in me. Well, early stage means something different to you than it does to us, right? Early stage to us is really more of a sign of revenue, right? It's not really a sign of how where your product is, how early your product is. It's like early revenue. You know, you can talk to five investors and they'll all give you a different definition of early mm -hmm. stage. Thanks. Promise, <clears throat> right? So if you want to raise money, take some time to understand what that means and how that works. Because if you start too early, you'll get in the rat race, you'll start talking to investors, and you'll get a bunch of no's and you won't understand why. Because a lot of investors won't take the time to explain to you why not. Mac will. I, I, I will. That, that, that is something I will tell you. This government has to do it. But just, just know, take the time to understand what you're doing before you go do it. Because otherwise, you're going to get a bunch of no's, you're going to get bitter, and then you're going to start writing these thought pieces about why, you know, black people can't get venture dollars. And it's like, but if I look at your business, your business don't deserve money. Like, I don't care what you're saying, right? So I try to avoid that. And that's something I see time and time again. And it gets frustrating. And, and the reason why I know is because I did. You know, when I started pitching to raise money, I was not ready to raise a cent. But I just saw all these articles of people giving money, and you're supposed to talk to investors and put a pitch deck, so I did that. But there's so much more to it. So take the time to learn that, or talk to folks up here to understand what that means before you get into that rat race. So. No, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next question is in terms of location. So uh, when a lot of people think about tech firms, they'll, they'll think about Miami or they'll think about uh, San Francisco, Silicon Valley. 
Um, but what about and some bias. <laughs> the DMV, for instance, where they're founded and operated and they don't have any uh, intentions on relocating? What advice would you give to those, to those startups? So I'm going to jump in because I, I, I literally just came back from California and had a great time, right? 75% of all venture capital goes to three states, California, Massachusetts, and New York. 75% of that all goes to California, right? San, Fr um, San Francisco and Silicon Valley is what it is purely because of density of capital. That is the only thing that makes them what they are. And no other part in the country can compete with that. Like, you just can't. Like, you're just not going to be able to make up the 80-year, 90-year head start they got of just simply density of capital, right? But if you're here and you're in the DMV, you're in Maryland, D.C., Virginia, there's capital here. Not nearly as much. And so you can raise your seed round. Probably raise your Series A. Maybe. Once you get past that, you're going to have to look out of state. Now, there, are, there were some trends in the earlier 2000s where if you raise money out of state, very often those investors will ask you to move to be closer to them. Why? Because once you start taking money from larger VCs, they're going to ask for a board seat, which means you're going to have a meeting with them once a month, once every other month, or once a quarter. And they don't want to have to fly to come to those meetings. They don't want to take those meetings over the phone, so they're going to ask you to move close. Now, over the last few years, more and more investors have realized that it's better sometimes for entrepreneurs to stay where they are, just because it's cheaper, because you, you can't afford to have office space in, in San Francisco, and they don't want you spending their money on rent, right? <clears throat> or it's cheaper for you to buy, to pay for um, technical talent here on the East Coast as opposed to the really competitive West Coast, right? So. Entrepreneurs are able to push back on that more now, but at the end of the day, when you raise money, it's going to be about what leverage you have, right? You are the talent, so you're coming to us telling us how great of a company you have. So if your company's making all the numbers, doing all the things that it needs to do, and you can make a case of why you need to stay in Baltimore, all right, you made your case. But if you're telling me your company's doing great, but you're struggling find, trying to find the top talent, or you can't find some people to add to your C-suite, I may have to tell you to move to San Francisco because I'm going to have a network out there where I know I can get you those things right away. All right? So it's up to you to make the presentation to me to tell me why you need to stay where you are geographically. Right? Because if you meet an investor who's in Seattle who's going to give you a bunch of money, their network's probably closer to Seattle. So any help that they can give for key hires and things like that are going to be out there. So they're going to want you to be close. But if you can tell them, hey, I can get all that stuff here, I figured that out, you can be wherever you need to be. But it's on you to make that, to, to, to make that pitch. Because if I'm the investor and I'm giving you the big, the big check, I'm probably going to want you close just because I'm lazy. I'm like, that's when, when I think about geography, I really, I, I agree with the, the math that Mac presented. And uh, if you're raising venture money, it is three states. Um, but, but I think the hard thing is that first $200,000. And I come from that seed perspective. Um, and I think that when you think about pitching to a VC, a guy like Mac who has a fund or portfolio perspective, you know, he's looking for venture level outcomes and he only needs to be successful on a handful of those across the whole portfolio. I just need to be successful in one. And he requires though that that's really, really successful. And that conversation is best had in some of those other places, but the conversation about the first $200,000 from angel investors that'll get you out of your day job and working in your startup, yes. that, conversa that conversation sounds a lot different because these aren't folks that are holding a portfolio. These are folks that are having a professionally assembled asset allocation portfolio by a professional RIA, an investment advisor, and they've got them diversified in cash and bonds and stocks. And what they're putting into angel investments is the fund money. That's the alternative assets, that's the private equity, that's the venture capital, and they're really cheating on that RIA by investing in startups. And they don't do 30 deals in two and a half years like Mac does, they'll do a handful. And the way to get their attention and to get that first $200,000 is not to tell a financial story, it's to tell a story about intimacy, so can they get close enough to the business to feel like they understand it and it's de-risked. So this is the one or two or three investments they make that year. It's about influence. If they're in the deal, can they make the deal better because they're leveraging some skills or some access that they have? And it's about the intangibles. 
It's the idea of them being able to be excited about being relevant in a small business again. And I use the word small business very deliberately there. Not a venture outcome, but a small business. And so this is a great place to raise your first $200,000. We have incredible access to capital. When you think about Maryland, when you think about the Annapolis area, you've got folks that have chosen to live here because of the Chesapeake Bay access and the boating community. And um, it's not a great place for venture, but it's a great place for seed investment. And when you really think about who your investor set is and what your objective is for that fundraise, I think you can parse that out and have two very different conversations. Yeah, I would agree. I think, you know, we work with a lot of early stage companies and, you know, a lot of the companies that are members at our space aren't necessarily going after venture funding right off the break. So I think Jeff's absolutely right. I think the DMV, you know, particularly Maryland, you know, has a, a, a good batch of different programs, uh, accelerators or what have you. Um, another thing that hasn't been mentioned is, is pitch competitions. You know, a lot of these, uh, you know, we have several people that we work with that have won significant dollars and when I mean significant dollars I'm saying fifty to a hundred thousand dollars that could be something that just gets their MVP off the ground and gets into market um, so that they can start generating some traction and generating some revenue so I actually think the DMV is in a good position at least like Jeff said for that that early stage uh, money no I'm good I think these guys had it <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Jeff, you, you did mention uh, angel investments. Can you uh, explain the difference for us, uh, angel investment and venture capital, just for anyone who might have any confusion? Sure, I mean, that, that to Matt, right, or me? No, you, 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 you mentioned angel. it. So oh, sure, sure. Um, you know, I think it's about a return expectation. Um, venture capitalists are custodians of other people's money. They're taking limited partners' investments, and they're responsible to deliver financially an IRR, so an annual return of somewhere in the 20 to 30 percent world, and they're expected to deliver over a 10-year investment horizon a return that is going to get them hired again to do the same thing for fund number two. And so diversification and applying what would be described as modern portfolio theory is the name of the game for those folks. And so they're looking for home runs, to use a baseball analogy. They're looking for one or two of the deals that they do to carry the entire portfolio. And so that changes the way they interact with the company. They're not going to be okay at year three and year four. Even if the company is profitable and delivering awesome K-1 returns, uh, that's not going to fit their investment thesis. Whereas an angel investor is investing in less deals and is excited because of the two words that I used, intimacy and influence, to be involved, actively investing in oftentimes flexing a skill or a muscle they, they learned in a previous career that got them to the position where they had that investable capital. So angel investors are doing it almost recreationally, and they're doing it because they believe in what those founders are doing. One is an emotional investment. The other is a mathematical investment. And so just to add to that, just to, to simplify things a little bit, an angel investor is somebody investing their personal money. So for the, the spectrum of angel investors, there are a bunch of angel investors who invest for a bunch of different reasons and a bunch of different styles, right? They're just playing with their own money. Venture style, a venture invest, investor invests other people's money. And so like the, 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 the needs and the wants are just going to be, those are the fundamental difference, right? When Jeff says he makes an investment, that is with his personal money. So he makes that decision whatever reason he wants to make it for. He he he, he justify, all he got to do is justify it to himself and his wife. He ain't got to justify it to nobody else. When I make an investment, I got to justify it to the state of Maryland. Like, hey, this is what I'm doing with taxpayer dollars. Just, those are like the fundamental differences. Um, I have a friend who's an angel investor who says, like, he says I invest up to $100,000 a year because that's how much money I can spend without having to talk to my wife about it. <laughs> and that's, that's how he makes it. That's how he, that's how he invests, right? right? He's like, I can, I can break up 100000 however much I want because I don't have to have a conversation. Anything beyond that, me and my wife got to sit down at the dinner table and talk about it, right? Like, like for angel investors, they just... They are people investing their money for whatever reason. And so the more affinity they have for the company, the more they feel like they can help a company, the more interesting it is for them. Thank you. Perfect. And, and Calvin, you, you had mentioned uh, criteria that you look for in different startups. So I just want to uh, ask if you have anything to add to that and then open it up to the rest of the panel or maybe if you have different criteria yourselves that you uh, kind of make sure you want to see before you well, 
to, to be clear, we don't, I don't invest in startups. So, so <laughs> to, to the point that Jeff was making about, um, this is actually a good point yeah. to, to bring up, where there are angel investors that are doing emotional, and then there's people who invest in other people's money. When you talk about other people's money, you can break that up different ways, too. So there's like, there is venture, then there's growth equity, and then there's like buyout private equity. So venture is it, pretty much anything under a million dollar checks, from $5,000 checks to the pre-seed checks we were doing with the Builder Fund, which were like 50,000. Yep. Angel checks to seed stage checks, which are like normally up to a million. Then there's growth equity. Growth equity is for companies that have figured out their business model. They are making strong revenue. They probably are profitable, but they, they may not be profitable. But they, if they are not, they normally have a path to profitability. And the funding that's coming to them is to infuse into sales, marketing, and growth. Or maybe they're, maybe they're in a region, maybe they're in the Maryland, D.C. area, and they're doing a great job, and they want to go to New York, or they want to go to some other strategic geography where they think they could really, you know, bust through the seams. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, what I, that's what I do. And then there's buyout equity, which are mega deals, a company that, like, when you think about the, the, the huge private equity firms, KKR, um, Th th those types of companies are buying a company and doing financial engineering to pro to provide their returns. Those are the, the bad guys, in my opinion. <laughs> so I mean, they're not always bad, but like when you hear about private equity cutting jobs, it's usually like buyout. Whereas growth equity is about creating jobs. It's about helping you to build your company to be something from where it is to to, to better. So when I'm looking at, you know, my criteria, I want to know. I'm really looking at your business model. I'm really looking at the way you make money. And I'm looking at your management team and all the people that are on the bus. Because by the time that you, you're, look, you're, you're talking to me, you've got a solid group of folks. And all these are the people that can take your company from $5 million to $50 million, and then from $50 million to $500 million. And they may or may not be those people. But, but if, if they are, and if I can believe that this is a company that can really grow, and if I believe that it's in an industry that can get me a high multiple, a high return, then I want to make an investment. There are companies that are, so even amongst the type of investments that we make, there are companies that fit the profile, but they just aren't, they're what's called a low multiple company. So for example, if you are a service, let's say you are an accounting firm and you are growing your accounting firm. I'm probably, I'm probably not going to invest in you because even though you may be profitable, the, the way you get your your return, your, your revenues, it's not necessarily recurring revenues or it's not necessarily very sticky for your customer. Versus if you're a software as a service or if you're a B2B, then I'm probably going to be more interested because those and traditionally are companies where the revenue is more recurring. It's, I know that you're going to always get that, that revenue and you're going to continue <coughs> to grow. So I bring these three things up to say that my criteria is very much financially based. It's very much other people's money and the need for return and the need to know that the structure of the corporation is there to be able to grow. But for the purpose of this conversation, that startup capital is very much what these guys were saying, where, you know, am I making an emotional decision because I have an expertise that I think can be helpful to you? So now I'm going to give you money because my money is going to help you grow and I'm going to be able to give you the, 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 my, my resources, my network. I think that's important. Or if it's venture, you know, it's, it's to, the, to the evaluation that Mac was talking about. So, so I would say one of the criteria is like if you're going to send me a pitch deck or you're going to talk to me, these are like the basic things I'm going to be looking for. What's the problem you're solving? What's the solution to the problem? What's the size of the market? What's your business model? How do you make money? What's your traction? How much traction do you have? If you're a B2B company, what's your pipeline? You know, what companies are in your pipeline that you're talking to? Or schools or whatever. Um, what are your three to five year projections? Now understand when I ask for projections, I know they're going to be wrong. <clears throat> I, don't, I don't actually care what the actual number is. It's more of a thought exercise for me to understand how you're thinking about growing your business. Because if you show me projections in year five where you're going to be at three million dollars in revenue, eh, that's not interesting for me, right? Or if you show me year five where you're going to be at five billion dollars in revenue, eh, you probably overestimated yourself and we're going to have to have a real conversation about why you think that is, right? Um, a really big one for me is go-to-market strategy. What's your go-to-market strategy? Who are your competitors? Who's the team? 
and then like how much how much are you looking for right those, those are the key things that i'm gonna look for <clears throat> in like a pitch deck but for me personally the, the things i hone in on is really around your traction and your customer acquisition right i'm looking for people who are very clear on what their customer acquisition strategy is and knowing that it's a repeatable strategy that's going to continue to get them customers as they grow right whether it's through buying your customers or through some kind of unique way of going about it. And for me, the reason why that's big for me, if I know you're thinking very critically about your customer acquisition, that means you're thinking very critically about problem solving. So that means as you grow your company, I know your company's going to change. I know you're going to, there's going to be shifts. You're probably going to pivot along the way. But I now believe in the way that you're thinking about gaining customers along the way. I'm going to believe in the way you're going to solve problems along the way as well. Wow, it's a tough bar to follow. It's a good answer. Um, Thank you. From a MCVC perspective, so our investment firm, um, you know, we really we, we have a watchword there, and this is a roommate of mine at the Naval Academy 20 years ago, and I investing our own capital, and we use the term virtuous commerce for that. And so we're applying that three different ways. <laughs> We've been limited partners in other private equity funds, including other VC funds. We've syndicated deals where we've shown financial leadership as the first check in the deal and then brought other capital around it ourselves. And then we've been direct angel investors. And so we're looking for social impact businesses that are for profit. And when we say virtuous commerce, we mean not CSR as a replacement, but we're thinking about in the natural operating model of the business is an underserved community being helped. And so we're able, because that's our own thesis, to make it pretty malleable. Um, to, to stretch it to where we're just feeling comfortable about the founder and the founding team. For the Accelerator Founder Track, we have a very specific thesis, and it is all about the fact that founders all come from very different backgrounds. Founders have their own archetypes. Oftentimes you'll find a product founder that's really good at technology. Sometimes you'll see a market-based founder that saw a problem in an industry that they worked in, and they decided to launch a startup to solve that. But when you Look at each of those founders. They're really, really good at one thing, usually not four or five things. And so what that leads to in every business is what we call asynchronicity. If you think about finance, leadership, product, and marketing, most startups get way, way, way out in front on one thing that is their best skill set. And that leads to tons of risk and tons of waste in that startup. And so everything we do in Founder Track is to pour into that gap or that asynchronicity and try to get each level of the business caught up to eliminate that risk and eliminate that waste. And so our mentors, our Sherpas, the capital we bring in through our network and our content is all geared towards finding what is that number one gap of asynchronicity and closing that gap so that the outcome is a more investable startup that's gonna waste less and be less risky for investors. Yeah, the only other thing that I would add on top of that is, uh, you know, if you can clearly define what your competitive advantage is, I think that's very important. Um, you know, again, I we tell startups all the time, you know, you might be working on something under the radar, you know, nobody necessarily knows, maybe you have a couple beta testers or what have you, but as soon as you step on the public scene, you're automatically creating competition. And you may not see them, you know, six months from now, 12 months from now, two years from now. But if you can clearly define from the beginning what your competitive advantage is, you have a higher probability of at least landing some, some early stage capital. And, and to add on top of that, you should be able to clearly define who your early adopters are. You know, go-to-market strategy is definitely key and definitely very important, but if you can figure out who are you, who's your very first customers that you want to get and why they're your very first customers, um, I think that's also a very key um, question that you should be able to answer very uh, directly um, because, again, at the end of the day, you have to know your customer. You have to know your target audience. You know, you, not every product is for everybody. Just because you sell Coke, just because I'm thirsty doesn't mean I, you know, I like Coke. Just because, you know, I wear shoes doesn't mean, you know, I, you know, I like Nikes or what have you. You know, that Nike has a clearly defined customer audience, target audience or what have you. So, again... You can define your competitive advantage and also who your early adopters are. Naturally, after you start gaining traction, where it gets out, you'll probably get some more sales. But at least that's questions that we see very often that many founders can't answer quite definitively. Um, and that's, you know, two pieces that I would just add to that. Uh, so when, 
when we get into you know ideas and, 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 and the founders will come to you, what are some of the most attractive or uh, viable spaces that you found for for investment? If that makes sense. What what spaces are the hottest out there that that uh, that you've seen? That's interesting. So, I've I've seen a few trends, right? One is this trend around like um, vending machines and automation. Mm. So in Brazil right now, there's a product that basically if you put all your ingredients in, it will cook dinner for you, right? And it is, it is like, it is a thing. Like they come to your house, they set it up, you put all the stuff in, and it just goes, right? Um, I forget what it's called, but like, you know, there's, um, you know, there's, there's this, this, this black woman who created these uh, vending machines that had pieces in them. If you walk around the airport, they got vending machines for all kinds of things. I just saw a vending machine that had black hair care products in it in the airport. Like, word. Right? Like, like that's a really interesting space. The other one, AI. AI is on anything, everything, whatever. Um, on the um, life sciences side, we're seeing a lot of stuff around. There's, there's always a lot of stuff in this area, but around cancer. There's a lot of innovations around cancer coming out. Um, a lot of devices. Too. A lot of devices. Um, oddly enough, on the food side, this there's this whole wave of plant-based products, alternatives <clears throat> to meat, right? One of the um, I, I met a company in California that makes a plant-based alternative to shrimp. What? Right. And there's 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 tons of companies <laughs> out there <laughs> in that space, right? Like that is a hot hot, hot space. There's a ton of companies doing plant-based alternatives for all kinds of meat. Shrimp was just really good, like I, I had to admit that. Shrimp was good. Um, and then this thing about blockchain. Blockchain is no longer, you know, the, 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 the cryptocurrency and everything. If you go out to, like, Eastern Europe, cryptocurrency is a thing. Block, you know, Bitcoin's a thing, whatever. I would say here in the U.S., we're starting to see blockchain being used more properly as just underlying technology. Right. And seeing a lot of cross pollination of blockchain and AI, um, the drone industry used to be hot. It's kind of tapered off a bit, you know. So, 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 there's, so there's there's ebbs and flows to these things. But those are just a few of the industries that I've seen that are really hot. I, I, yeah, go ahead, please. Oh, no. I, I was just gonna say uh, real quick the blockchain piece. We just had an event. Um, Baltimore Innovation Week last Saturday, uh, specifically about blockchain, and uh, coincidentally, you know, there was one uh, member in the audience that was talking about how she wants to use blockchain to solve for voter registration problems mm -hmm. or what have you, and authentication and things of that nature. So we're hearing that as well. Um, another thing that we hear uh, a lot about is voice. Um, you know, just voice activated. Um, you know, your Alexas, your series, or what have you, you know, people getting into that space. Um, don't see too many companies in this area doing that, um, at least to our knowledge, but, you know, just knowing that as a, a, an underlying trend um, is another big industry. And it's really voice to impact the IoT or Internet of Things, right? Yeah. I mean, as we get more and more closer to the smart homes, that's the thing, right? What do you want to say, Joe? Yeah, I'll, uh, I, you know, I'll also say that, Aside from picking a certain vertical, there, there's also recently a set of founders that I've been talking with that have said, if you do something that works by way of a template in a certain vertical, you can lift that template or that business model and apply it to another vertical. Uh, this group specifically was lifting success they had had um, with a very hands-on sport, which is uh, valet parking and moving it into car dealerships. Um, the, the other application I think that's super interesting is uh, 12 years ago, 15 years ago, I used to be infuriated when on my Windows computer I had to install a driver. There was this pop-up <laughs> screen. And, and like the thought in my head was, I don't want to know about drivers and any of this business. And, and Mac, Apple solved that for me. I never have to deal with any of that back-end stuff anymore. And so uh, we got a pitch from a company that's doing the same thing for car mechanics. I don't want to know about my car, and every time I go into the mechanic, 
he tells me some scary things that I don't understand or know about. And so this company is disaggregating the idea that you just need a relationship with the company on a mobile app and you don't have to worry about any of that other stuff. And so those are great examples of lifting a template or a business model that works in one vertical and then applying it to another. And, and we're super interested in that. We're, we're super interested in founders that have said, hey, this worked and the business can be lifted and exported somewhere else. And so you know, that frees us up a little bit from thinking from the lens of vertical specific to what business models are working and where can they be applied as a template elsewhere. So, so, so I know the, company, the first company you spoke about, I love those guys. And <laughs> not only did they lift it to do it for car dealerships, yep. but there's another group of folks that they, that work with them under the valley that are now lifting it and doing it for, for um, boats, the same thing. So yeah. it's, a, it's, got a, it's, a, it's a great like cool trend. The other area that I'll add an area, which is um, workforce development, which when I originally, when we originally started looking at it, I thought this doesn't make, eh, maybe. But, but so, so Catalyte was the invest, was one of the investments and there's a, the one on the term sheet is, is a company in Colorado that does the same thing where they are, they're a software development firm purely, first and foremost. But instead of just you know hiring great software developers and having them work on projects for enterprise clients, they have created a, they've, they've created, a, a, what's the word, a, um, sort of like a boot camp where they're taking baristas and you know, delivery people um, and you know, folks that are making 20 to $35,000 a year putting them through an AI assessment to say, are you somebody that can be trained into being a coder? And if the, if the answer is yes, then they train you to be a coder and then they make you an apprentice on a project, put you through a, like a few thousand hours of, of a series of projects, and then they either keep you on board for other projects or they let you be hired by the, the, the person who, who brought, who, whose project it was, the enterprise client. So this is, is a big deal because the demand for software developers is far outpacing, far outpacing the supply coming out of schools. Um, and those who are coming out of schools, they're asking for seventy to one hundred and twenty thousand dollars, depending on the school. These individuals who are former baristas, you could pay them sixty thousand dollars, and everybody wins, right? They're getting more money they've ever seen in their life. They're doing, they have a career. Right? In two years, they can be making the same money as the person that's coming out of MIT or in five years, right? But they're just happy at the fact that they're not making $25,000 anymore. Mm -hmm. The enterprise client is excited because they're paying less, right? And then there's more margin opportunity for, the, for, for Catalyte or for the other company that we have on the term sheet. So this space, I think, is going to be huge as Internet of Things and, you know, the reality is coding is, is going to be the new trade, in my opinion. It, sh it should have been a trade by now. It's not. Yeah. This is going to be the way that makes it happen. So, and then I'll add two more industries. One, if you look at venture capital, a lot of money is going to SaaS companies, um, software services, just because um, they're companies that can grow. There's some very standard metrics behind them, and they typically have recurring revenue. So, like, it's really easy as a company grows to go in and start to understand the multiple, start to understand the exit opportunities and all that. There's a lot of venture money going that way. The other one is the cannabis industry. And when I talk about it, I don't mean like the actual growing of the products, but you gotta think about for any industry, there's a lot of ancillary things. So like for Q&A, for logistics, for payment, there's still federally, it's still a, a class A drug, right? So you can't just pay with every credit card. So very often you got to pay with cash or with some other form of payment. There, there's a lot of things now that is, as the cannabis industry is becoming more and more legalized, there's a lot of stuff in that industry that's still left behind because they haven't had to do it before. And so as it starts to spread to more states, as the stuff starts to travel, as you start to see um, fake products hit the market, mm -hmm. like, you know, how do you know what you're getting is like, came from this dispensary or is the quality. Like there's a lot of things there that people are just now starting to try and figure out. And so if you ever want to be in an industry where you get a chance to get on the ground floor, cannabis is one of those industries that's starting to develop. This is a, this is a very good point. So I actually had a conversation yesterday with a, with a gentleman. So there's this company in New York, blockchain company, and they're sort of to what you guys were saying, where they, they are a series of developers that are just great at blockchain and they build platforms for people. So it doesn't matter what you're trying to sell or what you're trying to do, 
they can help you do it using the blockchain for mostly for like verification of different things like this. So in the cannabis industry, the conversation, first of all, I'm trying to, I'm trying to make an investment in this company, but the cannabis industry was pretty cool because it's exactly what you said. He said there, they are seeing that there are a lot of products that are hitting the market that are just not quality. And that the company that they're going to engage with wants to use blockchain to confirm throughout the entire process, the quality of the product from growing all the way to consumer. I mean, there was just an outbreak in uh, Nevada where there was a bunch of uh, product that had mold. Mm -hmm. And like, if you don't know what molded weed looks like, you just buy the weed, it's like, oh, it's got some hairs on it, it must be good. But it was mold, right? <laughs> like, what is, the, what, is the, what is the quality assurance of the products as they leave? Like, there's, there's a lot of room for things to be used for that. And more interesting enough, if you think about the industry and you think about Maryland specifically, right? We got Johns Hopkins right here. We got UB right here. There's a lot of medical devices that have been created for testing drugs and testing food that could probably be repurposed mm -hmm. for cannabis. There's probably a lot of, you know, patents from these local universities that have the potential to be licensed that could be used for other industries, right? These are things that I think entrepreneurs should think about more often. Perfect. Yeah, uh, please. I, sorry, it just came to me. I'll just say one last thing with that <laughs> is um, just because the industry is hot, like like Max said, doesn't mean that you have to have like the it thing in that industry. And what I mean by that is, okay, cannabis is over the past several years has started to become more legalized or what have you. But you know, we're in a blue collar, historically a blue collar town, right? So m manufacturing is still relevant when it comes to you know, the equipment that's used to grow these plants and the process of these plants or what have you. So you don't have to necessarily be the rock star entrepreneur, you know, articles all over the place because I'm growing weed. You know, I'm just using cannabis as, as an example here. But you can have those support mechanisms or you can have your main business can be that support or that secondary, um, I guess, functionality for that market and still do very well. Because again, like Max said, a lot of things are still catching up to it. So if you can kind of catch that wave and, and see what that, that trend is before it actually hits, you know, even if it's not the primary thing for that industry, if it's a support service or what have you, you could still be viable, especially when it comes to uh, potential investment. Very good point. That's a good point. That's a good point. And, uh, you know, when we're talking about uh, <clears throat> different projects that, that have been brought to you over the years or ideas um, when do you know that you have something that's you know very unique kind of earth-shattering that uh, really could could go the distance and um, you know do you have any examples of those ideas that you you've seen in the past when do you know I, I think it's difficult to know I think ultimately you just keep pivoting until you find something that's that gels and you everybody good good entrepreneurs start with a great idea and then they start running it down and then they realize this doesn't work in some way and then they tweak it and then they tweak it and then they tweak it and they keep pivoting till they get to what makes sense the business model now makes sense the product now makes sense and they they're tweaking based on what they hear from their customers and from the market and then eventually you get to something that is investable and then even after that, you continue to tweak, you continue to iterate. I mean, there are companies that, are, that make it to the size that we invest, and they still have to iterate or tweak yeah. or, or, or redo the platform because the market has changed. I think, I, I think and uh, you know, these guys may know, may know some more, but I think you never kind of know if it's going to go to distance. You just always believe it's going to go to distance yeah. based on the information <laughs> that you're seeing today and the hard work that you're going to put into it. And the founder, right? So, like, I would say for most investors, the day you write a check and hand the founder the money, you believe in them and you believe they have the ability to do it, right? Like, every time I've ever closed on a deal to write a check, I've always been excited. And now, most of those companies I know are going to fail. But still, at the time that I wrote the check, I thought they were going to be successful, right? Um, but one company I'll talk about, I'll, I'll give two stories. One is a company that me and Calvin invested in called Scholar Me. It's a young kid. I think when we wrote them the check, he was 18 or 19, just turned 20. We gave him the first check ever, $40,000. And it's a platform to help college students 
um, fill out their FAFSA, fill out for scholarships, and, and fill out student loans, right? Cool company. Kid was really young, super smart. Like, the day we met him, we knew he was smart. Like, I didn't know if the company he was building was going to be the company that was going to be a billion-dollar company, but he was going to build something that was going to be a billion-dollar company. Right. I just knew that. bet on him. Right. They, him and his um, co-founders just finished Y Combinator, right? Group from, come from Baltimore, went to Y Combinator, number one accelerator <coughs> in the world. It was one of the top five companies to come out of the accelerator. Paul Graham, the founder of Y Combinator, put a personal investment in that company. That company raised $2 million in three days on a really high valuation. They're on a rocket ship. They're, going, they're probably going to do amazing things. But at the end of the day, it's still a caveat. It's still early, it's still early money, right? They're going to raise another round of significant capital and get another high valuation. And they could burn out. Now, that company could still fail. But right now, we're riding high. It's looking really like it's going to be successful. I think this company has a chance to be a billion-dollar company. But it's really early in the life cycle, right? Another company I'll talk about is a company by the name of Solzy. It was an um, African-American founder, originally from Philadelphia, went to UPenn, started a company in San Francisco that allowed people to purchase, to make um, transactions on Facebook and then eventually on Instagram. Raised money from a bunch of really cool investors. And then the company flatlined. It was, it was growing steadily and it just kind of flat, flattened out, right? Still making money, still a viable company. And the investors came to the CEO and was like, look, man, either shut this thing down or do something different. Because they, they didn't invest in him to just be a steady company. They invested in him to go big. And so he created another company in parallel. And that company ended up being Wonder School. Wonder School is a platform that allows parents who do homeschooling to find teachers to help to do homeschooling for their kids, right? He, six months ago, raised a Series A round of $20 million led by Andreessen Horowitz, right? So his first company, he got some money for wasn't working out, his investor said, go build something else. And he did that. And so this next company is the one that looks like has a chance to be a billion dollar company. Mm -hmm. But he had to go through the process of that first company not getting to where he wanted it to be. And his investor saying, go build something else so we can invest in that. Because this one ain't working. Right? I've heard it said that um, the, the biggest lie that a founder will tell investors is their financial projections. <laughs> and it all look like this. And yes. Like, right. like, they're all funnily like X to the N or Y equals MX plus B steady. Right. Yeah. Steady too, yes. Um, but the biggest lie that investors will tell founders is the valuation. And if you really push them on how they came up with the valuation, you'll typically hear a disclaimer that starts with, well, valuing early stage companies is an art, not a science. Well, if you're a math guy, you know that's a signpost on the road that it says, bullshit approach it. Here it comes. <laughs> and you'll hear some sort of coefficientless, non-linear regressed equation that always ends with, we're investing in the founder and the founding team. And so, you know, the answer is that at the seed, at seed level, it's, it's a bet on perseverance. It's a bet on track record of what that person has done previous, previously in their life. That's a predictor of how they're going to do as the founder of a company. Um, you know, one of the deals that we invested in at MCVC that also came through our Accelerator Founder Track is a company called LiveChair. And LiveChair has relocated to the Baltimore area, and LiveChair is putting blood pressure cuffs and weight scales in barber shops. And the founder of LiveChair grew up in an environment where his father was incarcerated, so all of the mentorship and advice he had his entire life came from his barber and that relationship. And now his father's 53 and dying of cardiovascular disease and has had multiple events. And Andrew said, you know what, I'm going to do something about this. And I'm going to start a company that leverages the trusted social space of the barbershop that I have since as an investor learned about. Um, I've gone into enough barbershops and asked, been asked if I'm a cop or I'm lost to, to be fully in the deal and, and understand that this is a special space. This isn't where my mom dropped me off to get a Floby haircut. This is a place that has tenured, trusted relationships, and taking health care to that space is something that Andrew knew because of his background. And he convinced us on, and we're all in because of that. And it's all about the founder and that conviction and that story. You know, I would say... Um, you know, it's your ability to, especially if you're tackling big problems, to make something that may seem complex very digestible and simple to your uh, end, end user and customer. Um, I think that's very important. 
Um, outside of that, I agree with everything that these guys have said. Covered <laughs> a lot of ground. <laughs> a lot of ground. Okay. Um, in your experience, I don't, I don't know if you guys said how long you've been doing what you've been doing, but in terms of mistakes along the way, can you recount a time that you made a mistake that you look back on and it's kind of painful now that you think about it but it taught you a lot in what you would do differently now uh, with hindsight. I'm, I'm, I'm going to jump out on that one. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Just because um, you know I'm, I, I believe in this very dearly so you know before I start talking about anything that we do at the Startup Nest I always share the story about you know me being a serial entrepreneur and you know we ended up having one key exit that gave us the capital to do what we're doing now but in that story, um, we engaged with our very first investor who ended up not being who he said he was going to be. And ultimately, we recovered, got back on our feet, and came out you know, on the positive side. But what I would say is, if I ever had to go back, is as much as investors are trying to digest and dissect whatever it is that you're presenting to them, flip that around and interview them just as much as they're interviewing you. Mm -hmm. Tell us, tell me about your past performance. Tell me about your portfolio, your methodology. Like, what is your, you know, like, what are your, like, let's break down this term sheet so that, like, I can tell my grandmother and she can understand it. And I, I'm serious because, again, when you get into those deals, like, there may be attorneys at the table. You may be feeling pressure. You may have said, hey, look, I didn't give this everything that I had. I'm going to take this deal regardless. Don't go in there with those blinders. Be mindful of the fact that this is a two-way street in a lot of different ways. This is a conversation that you need to have. This is not a, a job interview. This is a conversation. And that is something that, you know, as an early entrepreneur, um, again, I started my first company when I was 21, but I didn't raise money until I was 28. Um, again, different companies, things of that nature. But if I had to go back, I would take more time doing due diligence on who it is that you want to present. And... Spend some time doing that before you get to the table. You don't necessarily have to sit across and have a chess match, uh, a, a debate with the person. Do your due diligence before you get to the table because not all money is good money and not all money, not every investor is for you. And I think that is very important that most people need, especially in the minority community. You know, there's so many things that, you know, that are arbitrary that we deal with in, daily, in our daily lives where it's like, I got to make it or I got to get this done for the family or whatever. And you, there's a lot of riding on this. But still, take that time. take Carve out that time to do your due diligence to make sure that if I enter into this agreement, what does that actually mean? Who is this actually? Per who is this person that I'm engaging with? Who is this firm that I'm engaging with? Because um, you're going to be married for a little while. And, uh, and that's just, you know, what it looks like. So that's gospel right there, bro. Yeah. That's gospel. Um, so, mistakes, it is so easy to fall in love with a deal. <laughs> it's so easy to like see a great entrepreneur, feel like this thing's going to be amazing. And you're getting into diligence and you're learning more about it and like it's easy to put blinders on the things that are red flags. Yep. <clears throat> so there's this one marketing company based out of New York that we were thinking about investing in. And I, I got lucky because we ended up not investing in it because the existing board did a number of things that ultimately killed the deal. Mm -hmm. But it was, a, it was a valuable lesson for me because I was fully all in, right? And like the partner, one of my partners was like, he's like, don't get too excited, Cap. <laughs> Do not get too excited. Then this thing happened and the deal was done and I was bummed for like two days. I was completely bummed, I put so much work in. Um, but the reality is what happened illustrated a risk to me that, you know, now that I'm totally unmarried to the idea of investing in this company, that would have completely killed the opportunity, you know, in the long run. So, you know, as an, as as an investor, it's very important for us to be disciplined as we meet people because you see so many, and then when you see one that you really like, to like really make try want to make that happen, to be disciplined to know that like when there are risks, you have to be able to see those things and like assess them for objectively. Um, to to add to Kyle's point about all money is not good money though, the flip side of that is the same for for you as entrepreneurs. One. Just because you got one no or 10 no's or 20 no's doesn't mean you won't get a yes. You gotta let those things roll off your back 
don't get wedded to the advice of some investors because if they haven't done what you're doing or if they're not the right money, the right investors, they might give you bad advice. A tech investor is not going to give you good advice if you're starting a, you know, a certain type of services company that they've never been in, right? Because they may say, oh, you, or if you're starting a manufacturing company, be even better. Because they're going to give you advice <coughs> that you need to be asset light, but if you're manufacturing something, you actually need to have money in inventory, right? Mm. This is just an example. So, um, so yeah, that's my point. Well, a disclaimer, MCVC has only been around for about five years, and our accelerator is only two years in, so we, we have a lot more mistakes than we do successes <laughs> that's at this point. That's enough time to have mistakes. Um, you know, one thing that surprised me, but I, I learned the hard way, is that uh, founders of startups are usually optimists. And you sort of have to be if you're going into the odds of one in ten of us are going to make it, it's very Darwinian. And being an optimist, I think, is what gets them to keep going in the face of all of the obstacles that, that, that pop up. But it makes them fundamentally not very good at a couple of things. <laughs> One of those things is hiring. An optimist in an interview is rooting for the applicant and is almost jumping across the table and hoping that they are successful. They start with a, a bias towards the person and they spend the next 15 minutes confirming that bias. And so if I had to do it over again, I would say that getting a founder who is an optimist support in the hiring process, you almost want a more negative or um, rigorous personality when selecting. Um, that would be one thing I wish I could do over again, and I've made that mistake several times. Um, the other thing that I see founders struggle with because they're optimists is they tend to be very defensive if they're on the product side about features and the thing that they've built and created. And so surrounding them with a team that's also able to be very objective and rigorous around product development. Um, both traits or attributes of optimists, but something that, you know, moving forward, we try to do a little bit differently. Okay. Uh, we've made mistakes, and so, like, our biggest mistakes have been around not, do, not, not spending enough time to do due diligence. I mean, we turn around our investments fairly quickly, so we don't do nearly as much due diligence as some others. Um, but being smart about those due diligence and paying attention to red flags that come up when we're getting to know founders. Um, the other thing is, um, for me personally, not staying true to my personal thesis. Um, we had a company we invested in who didn't pitch well, didn't have the traction, and like completely didn't fit anything that I look for. But there was a, a key piece there around there could be some, a real cool play around data and selling data and whatever. And so everybody in the room got stuck on that piece. Like, if we can figure out the data piece, this is going to be amazing. And that's when the investors in the room start coming up with, start trying to figure out how to grow the business in a way that the founder hadn't talked about. And so sometimes as investors, we get excited about, but the company could be X, Y, Z. Well, if the founder didn't tell us that, we need to stop trying to figure that out. And so we'll get excited about that. And so we actually invest in a company that was a horrible company to begin with because we said, hey, there's this data stuff here. We can make it work. And the room had this groundswell. And I was like, you know, I don't know, there's all this other stuff, but yeah, but we help them figure out this. Well, that's never what that founder wanted to do. So that founder never spent the time working on that, and then he just spent the time working on all the crappy stuff that wasn't working to begin with. And so at the end of the day, it was a terrible deal. And we had another company we invested in where the founder was really passionate, was going after a really cool idea, really cool space, didn't have a clue if it could actually work, but it was like, you could really get behind this founder. But you know, there was a few things that we missed out when we were meeting the founder, like, they mentioned that when they were in college, they didn't have any friends. Nobody liked them. It's like, ah, you're a black person. You lived in the Midwest. Maybe, you know, just, they didn't like you. You know, they, they couldn't understand what's going on culturally. It's okay. But no, this family didn't have any friends because they were just a hard person to deal with. Like, nobody wanted to work with them. And we very quickly realized we didn't want to do it either. <laughs> but, it was like, but we gave them an investment, so we're married. You know, it's like, I just married somebody I, 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 I don't want to be in the same room with. Like, I wish we had to listen to some of the things that founder was saying when we were meeting them, like, oh, that's a red flag, oh, that's a red flag. But it's a really amazing idea. There's a lot of passion. It's a, it could be huge. There's another red flag. There, you know, paying attention to the red flags. Sometimes, you know, like Calvin said, you get in love with the deal and you start ignoring some of the red flags. I'm going to add 
one other thing Please, today, yeah. and that is um, uh, let the market dictate your path in some different ways. Don't be so hell bent on, you know, I'm going to drive this thing home. If it's not, if it's something that's that's game changing, like you know, you bringing back people back from the dead or something like that, <laughs> so, something that nobody's done, because something, just about everything. I, I mean, obviously something's going to come out tomorrow that. As soon as I say this, it's been done. <laughs> but a lot of stuff has been done, right? And your market and your customers are going to dictate kind of the way that things go, especially in different industries. Listen to them. Listen to your target audience. Listen to your customers. If I had to start a company now, I would have as many focus groups or get as many people as I can together. I would get my product out to market so fast, even if it was ugly, you know, it had only a couple features or what have you. As long as they had my main functionality or my main components, I need to get it out there because you need that feedback so quickly. Because at the end of the day, investors, they're going to want to make sure that, you know, the, the, the level of risk is decreased as much as possible. So have you done your due diligence and talked to these people? Again, we're all human beings. We may fall in love with you as the person. We may see opportunities there, you know, in terms of just the industry. But have you done the due diligence to say, on a rainy day, can you still sell this product? Mm -hmm. Can you still get enough people to buy this so that you're still cash positive or what have you? So I would just say, you know, again, lesson learned. Don't be so hell-bent. Don't be so emotional. Um, we're all humans, and we all put our blood, sweat, and tears into our companies. However, we have to be objective, and we have to make sure that it makes sense. Every move that we make makes sense. Um, so, less on the emotion, more on the data, um, and that will be mine. Thank you. I want to take this time to make sure that I open the floor to the audience. So, if, if you have any questions, just to make sure you're getting the most value out of this, uh, please feel free. Yeah, please. So, do you all invest in any service based companies? I hear a lot about products or tech or fintech, blockchain, <coughs> cannabis, these different types of industry solutions. Uh, I did hear you, um, somebody mentioned an investment in an accounting firm saying no to it. But well, we invest in, so we do invest in services, but tech enabled business services. So t that means you have a service, but there's some sort of technology behind it that gives it a competitive edge that helps you to be more, to, to be smarter about the way you deliver your service. And typically, you're delivering your services to other businesses. Not to say that you don't. You, we wouldn't invest if it's a consumer focus, but in general, we like B2B sort of business. So I'll say very specifically, I'm fairly standard across the venture space. We don't invest in services companies, not because they're not good businesses. It's because typically services businesses grow too slowly, right? If I'm a venture style investor, if I'm doing venture capital, when I make an investment in you, I, in order for me to get paid, you either got to go public or you got to get acquired. And you got to do that in the next five to seven years, there are very few services businesses that have the ability to do that. So for us, so very honestly, in the venture in the venture space, we typically don't touch service businesses at all, and that's why we like tech companies because tech companies typically have the ability to grow really quickly, and typically have a, a much lower overhead. Right now, on Calvin's side, on the private equity side, they'll make investments in services businesses, but that service business might have been around for like 15, 20 years already. It's now at a point to like really grow and has some kind of nuances to having an exit in the next couple, next few years, right? I can't afford to invest in a company that's going to take 15, 20 years to get to the point where they can go public or, you know, start to get to a point where they start to have uh, conversations around uh, getting acquired. Like it, just, it just doesn't work. Yeah, to invest in a services business, the most important thing is, are the operations the standard operating procedure. Do you have scalable process in your services? So a great example is the company he mentioned, the Valley Parking Company. That's a company that before I came to Camden, they had invested in and grew from the guy who, who started it, Jerry South, he started it when he was like 18 in Annapolis. And quick, not quickly, but over 30 years or so, built this Valley Company parking company to be the largest valley company valley parking company in the United States and when they sold they sold for like 300 and something million dollars and he made 27 millionaires in this company it was, it's a great story but 
the key to to his company was that everybody had to do things a certain way. He would go to, to hotels and tell hotels, you should give me the first and last touch of every customer, which is when you park your car and when you pick up your car. And they would say, that's crazy. Why would I do that? Customer service is so important to me. He would say, because I do it better than you. Because I park cars for a living. That's what I do. You don't park cars. You put people in, 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 in beds. I park cars. And our process for parking cars is so solid that your customers are going to love it every time. Right, so his process, I remember there's a story that they, that they like to tell about some huge hotel in, in Florida, like Miami or something like that, and how they, there was something wrong there, and they were trying to figure it out, and my CEO, David Warnock, was, was like, Jerry, is it, is it fixed? He said, I don't know, I'm gonna go work the, the, I'm gonna go work the, um, the line for the weekend, and then I will let you know Monday morning. And then Monday morning, he calls them at like 6 a.m. and says, it's done, click. Why? Because he had to make sure that the process that he had built over his time from when he was 18 years old was was perfect at this place. The same way that he has been able to copy paste had been able to copy paste it at so many other hotels across the country. So if you have a services business, that's my my advice to you is to to build a scalable model. And building a scalable model means doing it, being able to do it well one place, and then the next place the same way or with small tweaks, but the ability to do it the same way to get the same results every time, every time you scale. I would, I would add on to that that, you know, where we are today is a generation of folks that have watched the TV show Shark Tank <laughs> and the TV show uh, on HBO Silicon Valley. And there is a venture culture vilification of lifestyle businesses that I think sucks. The entire size of the venture capital market is puny compared to the size of the private equity market. It's puny compared to the size of all of the ways to raise capital for your startup without pitching to somebody in a Shark Tank type environment or audience. And so I may be cheating a little bit on um, you know today's panel, but this is about minority innovation, not venture innovation. And so there's tons of great access to capital that's not gonna have the pressures of needing to scale in a venture J-curve type of way. And so I would love to talk to you afterwards about what are all the virtuous ways to fund a great, fundamentally profitable business where people that have a different investment horizon that aren't beholden to a fund mm -hmm. would love to get behind that. Yep. That's a good point. Uh, Richard Zicke um, from D.C., uh, Nesby Chapter, uh, great panel. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, my first question is, um, you talked about getting involved in angel investing. Um, I think a lot of, I, I definitely from hearing conversations uh, from, from the community about like how they can get, become angel investors without having to, I guess, have a lot of money. You know, like Seth Seven wants to get into it with, uh, I know they have like crowdfunding of angel investors. I mean, I, I like to hear your uh, different, anybody's take on, you know, if somebody wants to become an angel investor with a certain amount, with a small amount of money, if that's possible or not, and how, if it is, how can they do that? My second question is, you know, I'd love to hear your all's um, uh, comments and thoughts about a lot of the, these um, uh, major tech companies like WeWork. Uber, who have had major valuations when they hit the IPO and have just crashed, you know, and I think that has maybe soured a lot of people on this idea of these large tech companies and and the, I guess um, it's kind of corrupted how people think about you know tech startups, especially those big ones. I would love to just hear y'all's different takes on these on these two companies, the other companies that have gotten really big and then just kind of like flamed out because they've been overvalued. Um, I'll just look like here some of your comments. I'll take the first one. I think that um, one, of the, one of the best things we did early on was we took a seat at the table in a few private equity funds as limited partners. And that put us at a different level of conversation because we were funding funders and we looked at it like a mutual fund of startups, a mutual fund of investments. And so we were very humble because we weren't from stock picking or we, we were we were public trader personalities, and we weren't good at picking private investments. And so we really sort of delegated that out to the folks that were general partners in funds. And so about a year and a half ago, the law changed, and the amount of money that's required to be a limited partner in a fund 
um, is now dropped and now funds can get up to about 250 folks as limited partners. And so one very responsible way to start out, mm -hmm. instead of individually picking two or three startups, is to do it at a fund level. And you have professionals that are screening each deal for you, and you get to enter in a little different level of conversation. So that's one strategy um, if you had some capital to deploy in the market that's a diversified approach, and it takes the pressure off for you to pick stocks. So typically speaking, to be an angel investor, you got to be an accredited investor, right? Which means you basically make – Two hundred thousand dollars, or you have, was it like two hundred thousand dollars in assets, not including your home, right? You have to be somebody who's like independently wealthy. If you're not that, and you want to be an angel investor, crowdfunding, equity crowdfunding is the way to go, right? You can be a retail investor and make small, makes and do small investments in very specific type of crowdfunding investments, right? So you have to make sure whatever company you're investing in. They've, they've, they've filed for the right regulations in their fundraising for you to be an investor, for you to be a retail investor, is what it's called. Um, Republic is a great platform for that, right? Where you can go through, you can sift through things and see what companies you want to invest in, right? There, I know some people who have done that. If you do have the ability to be considered an accredited investor, what I tell people the best way to get started is join Angels List and join a few syndicates. It typically, it's typically like a buy-in, like $1,000 or $2,000, and you get to be part of the group. And basically, whatever company comes in for the other group to see, you get to see as well. And you can just take your time and kind of watch what kind of companies they see. Take a couple months and just do your own evaluation. Come up with your own ideas of, like, what a good company looks and feels like to you. And then start, you know, and take, like, a year. And, like, these are the companies I would pick, these are the companies I wouldn't, and see what, how they do over a year. To see if those companies are still growing or if the companies you pick weren't. Right? And give yourself a chance to kind of play around with it, right? Those are what I would say on the investment side. When it comes to the big tech companies, that's an unintended consequence of venture-style investing, right? When we invest in companies, we want you to grow. So I mentioned Carter raised the Series E round, $400 million. They got to burn through $400 million in two years. You need to go public or be ready to raise an even larger round of funds. And so then companies end up optimizing for growth and speed and not for sustainability. And what that does is that gives you a really high valuation at the time you IPO. So that means our firms and everything, we made our money. The people who get screwed are the folks who are going to invest in the public market, which is you, right? I don't really got to care about you. I got to care about getting returns for my fund, right? And so that's, that's the way that game is played. Um, has it soured some people? Sure, but it's not going to change anything. Right, because fundamentally, the way those companies got money, the people who gave the money are going to make their money back, right? And so they're going to keep doing that, right? Now, if there are, are room for different types of investments to happen, or different types of venture firms to be out there, yes, right? But that's a much longer conversation for another day, right? But like, what we see with Uber and what we see with WeWork, it's not the end of it. There's going to be more companies like that. There's always going to be companies like that. But then at the same time. Nike grew at the same kind of rate. Like, Nike's a prime example of why venture capital exists. Because they weren't bankable, because they were, every dollar that was coming in, they were spending to grow their company. And so no bank was going to give them a loan to continue to keep growing, right? So the only place they, they could have gone to would have been a VC firm. But there weren't any VC firms around for them to go to back then, right? But if they could have got VC dollars early on, they probably could have grown faster. And they would have been a sustainable company in the long run, right? I mean, Amazon... Jeff Bezos, richest man in the world, that company's only been profitable, I think, three years in its existence. They've been in the red every year. Why? Because all the money's going back into growth. And this is how it works. Yeah, there's, a, there's another firm um, called Net Capital. A, a, a friend of mine's from um, school just raised money using Net Capital. So it's a it's a similar to Republic where you can go online, review the pitch deck, and hear from the, the entrepreneurs, and you can put in small amounts, like you know a thousand or five thousand um, dollars. That's a good way to kind of dip your toe. I actually like Jeff's Jeff's approach, where if you are an accredited investor and you can invest in a fund, that's good because you 
you know you can see you get the opportunity to see all the deals that those professionals are doing and you can you can ask those professionals questions you get a lot of non-public information that could help inform you as to how how to think about investing and also um, you know what type of investing you like time for one more question. So I'll recommend a resource to you. It's a book called Cap Table Planner by Stephen Poland. And it's on the web at uh, www.1x1media.com. And he built a Excel spreadsheet model that's free. Just download it off the internet. And it allows you to take your co-founder shares and then walk through the entire capital journey from angel round to series A to B and then an eventual exit. And that empowers you as a founder to tell a reverse engineered story that will check all the boxes for each of those investors who each have a different hurdle that they need to achieve. And it, it, it's a very nice companion to your financial projections. One is the income statement story of the business. The other is telling a team win so that all of your capital partners are winning together um, at each stage of the capital stack. Um, what I would say is that that's, that's going to be different for every company, right? and your reason for raising capital. Like if you're in the life sciences, the reason of raising capital and the stages of raising capital and the amount of capital is gonna be very different than like a SaaS platform, right? Um, but generally speaking, the best and easiest time to raise capital is when you need don't need it, mm -hmm. right? It's when your company's growing, you got revenue, the company's sustaining itself, and the reason for you to get the capital is to use it for what it is, right? So like getting investment is a tool. It's a tool to grow. So if you have a plan for taking this money to grow, then, then, that's, then that's, that's what you're doing it for right now. I'll use a company that's here in Maryland. It's called Osmosis. They're a tool that helps uh, medical students um, get ready for tests and things, right, and, do, and study. Really cool product. And um, when I met the founders, they, they hadn't really thought about raising capital or whatnot. And, and the big portion of what they do is they create these little whiteboard videos, right? And so the more whiteboard videos they have, the more content they have, the more money they were making. And I said, and, and they didn't need any money. They were, they were going to do like 800000 in revenue that year. And so they were doing like, I think it was like, like four or five videos a week or something, right? And I was like, that's good. So you're doing like 20 videos a month. He's like, yeah. I was like, if I gave you a million dollars a day, how many videos could you do a month? He's like, I could probably quadruple that. If you could quadruple that, how much money would you end up making? He's like, I could like four or five X my amount of revenue. That's why you raise capital, right? You raise capital as a tool to grow. So the best time to raise capital is when you don't need it. Now, you may be at a point where you do need capital, and that's why you're going to raise. Fundamentally, it's just a different, it's just a different process, right? But the, the initial intention of the capital that you're raising is to grow one way or another, right? Uh, <clears throat> two, so I got three quick points. One, when it comes to what to do with the capital or, or when to raise capital, it, to, in some respects, as an entrepreneur, I expect you to be the. I expect you to know everything about your business and your market code. You should be telling me why you need capital today to get to whatever milestones. Because if 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 you have to be the smartest person, if you're not the smartest person then somebody else is going to be smart. If, if I feel like I'm smarter than you on this thing and why you need money today, then I'm not going to give you money. Because I want my investment to go to somebody who I believe is an expert <clears throat> at what they're doing. Number two, side, this is a quick side note, which is that his, his statement about getting money when you don't need it is it actually applies to personal finance too. Best time to apply for credit cards is when you don't need credit. <laughs> like, side note. Um, and then... <laughs> I tell, people this, I, tell, yeah, I tell people this all the time. The third thing, um, 
uh, Jeff made a book reference. And actually, a book reference came to my mind as well, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, to also supplement his, which is a, com a book called um, Founder, The Founder's Dilemmas by yeah. a guy named Noam Wasserman. So Noam Wasserman studied like 10,000 small businesses, um, specifically startups. And it's a great book. He, decided, he, he looked at what are the different dilemmas that the founder makes or has to deal with from starting a business. Do you start alone? Or do you start with people? Do you start with friends, family? Do you start with you know, coworkers or do you start solo? Those types of questions, all the way to when to raise money, all the way to uh, do I get a loan? Do, you know, what type of investments should I, should I get? Do I IPO? Do I sell my company? It's a, and the way that it's structured, each chapter is sort of uh, stands by itself. So you can buy the book, read the whole thing, and learn a lot. But if you have a specific issue today that you want to focus on, you can read that chapter and get that information, and it'd be really helpful. So I, that's a really good resource, I think, for you. Yeah, I'll just double down. Sales and growth, um, you know what I mean? The worst thing in the world is you want to be indebted to something that you don't have the ability to, to get that back to them. Um, so you want to, you know, I'll just reiterate what these guys said. Sales and growth are probably the most critical thing. Okay. Mac, Jeff, Calvin, and Kyle, thank you so much today for your time and uh, expertise. Round of applause for our team.